The other excellent function we've introduced is the Dirac function, sometimes called the Dirac delta function. The function that's zero everywhere except at a single point where its value is infinite. This is meant to be kind of modeling an impulse, a hammer striking a block, a bat striking a ball, a lightning striking a circuit. Any kind of input that's zero and then instantly very large and then back to zero. Now, if you want to consider this function, it's hard to talk about a value being infinity, but you could model it with a different function. You couldn't say it's like taking a function that only lives for a very brief time, if epsilon is a small number, a to a plus epsilon. Let's turn on a switch for just a tiny bit of time epsilon. And let's make the value of that switch 1 over epsilon. So that means if I turn on this switch for a tenth of a second, I'm assigning the value 10. If I turn on the switch for one hundredth of a second, I'm assigning the value 100. If I turn on the switch for a millionth of a second, I'm assigning the value 1 million. As epsilon gets smaller and smaller, this function, 1 over epsilon, ua of t minus ua plus epsilon of t, as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, in the limit, the limit as epsilon goes to 0, of these delta a epsilons of t is the Dirac function delta a of t. We can use that to compute the Laplace transform of the Dirac function. The Laplace transform of the Dirac function is the Laplace transform of this limit. Now I should argue why I'm removing this limit from the process, but I am allowed to remove this limit from the process and say I'll take the limit instead of the Laplace transforms of these delta a epsilons because they're made out of heaviside functions and I know how to deal with heaviside functions. The limit as epsilon goes to zero from the right of one over epsilon ua of t minus ua plus epsilon of t. ua of t is e to the minus a s over s. ua plus epsilon of t is e to the minus a plus epsilon s over s. They both have common s in the denominator so I'll add those two fractions and the 1 over epsilon out front puts an epsilon in the denominator. As epsilon goes to 0, the value of the numerator is 0 and the value of the denominator is 0. This is what you call in calculus an indeterminate form. So I'll use L'Hopital's rule. Let's differentiate this with respect to epsilon. And if the ratio of the derivatives has a limit, L'Hopital's rule says that the original limit has the same value of an indeterminate form. So I differentiate with respect to epsilon. This first piece has no epsilon in it, zero. Subtract, differentiate this piece with respect to epsilon, e to the minus a plus epsilon s. Well, the modifier, the multiple, the coefficient of epsilon is s. So what I get is an s and a minus sign, minus s come down. So I'll be subtracting minus s, e minus a plus epsilon s. That's the derivative of the top of the bottom with respect to epsilon is just s. The two minus signs combine to make positive sign. The two s's cancel out. And I'm taking the limit as epsilon goes to zero of e to the minus a plus epsilon s. That's the limit, or the Laplace transform of delta a of t is e to the minus a s. It's a curious, kind of an empty transform, but compare that with the Laplace transform of the heaviside function, which was e to the minus as times 1 over s. What does that mean if I multiply the Laplace transform of the heaviside function by s? I'll have s times the Laplace transform of the heaviside function is e to the minus as. The Laplace transform of the Dirac function is s times the Laplace transform of the heaviside function. Hmm, what does that mean about the relationship between these two functions?